Good to see you tonight. I'm so glad that you're here for Wednesday Night Live. Welcome those of you who are joining us online. Why don't you stand together and let's start with a call to worship from Psalm 145. We come tonight, we're going to just take some time right up front to bring our praise before our King, before our God, before our Father. And so I love this passage from Psalm 145, verses 1 to 7. We're going to read it out loud, and uh, it's our call to worship tonight as we prepare to praise our King. So would you read along with me, whether you're in the room, those of you that are watching online, wherever you are this evening, let's start off by reading this good and loud together, Psalm 145, beginning in verse 1. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Let's joyfully sing together.
God, we worship you tonight in spirit and truth. Receive our worship. Come on, let's sing. I would be hopeless. I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness. If it wasn't for the cross, you have won me with your kindness. Chase me down, and I was lost. Where would I be if it? to know Jesus tonight. Isn't it so good that you can always call on the name of your Savior? Yeah. And when you call him, he answers at his name, amen. That's something to shout hallelujah for tonight. I don't know about you. I want to invite you to do something tonight as we continue in worship. Just lift your hands with us, if you will. And let's just call out to our Father together just as one body and one heart. Father, we want just what you want. Tonight, we surrender our ideas, we surrender our thoughts, our emotions, God. We come and we lay those down at your feet, and we say, come and have your way in this place, God. All that we are, 
all that we have, we give to you for you truly, you truly are our everything. And we want to see you move in this place tonight. We've come expectant to encounter your presence, to meet you face to face. And so, God, whatever you're in, that's what we want tonight. And whatever you're not in, God, if you're not in it, we don't want it. We only want what you want. So come and speak to us tonight. We set our eyes on you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together, church.
want you to break through the noise. I want you to break through the distractions, the things that try to turn our head to the right and to the left. God, we fix our hearts and our eyes on you, the one who always has the answer. When we surrender well, you show us who you are. And so we pray, come and have us tonight. We put our lives on the altar before you and we say, if your presence doesn't go with us, we don't want you to send us on from this place. Come and speak to our hearts. May it be the sound of your voice alone that lets us know we're following the right leader. Receive our hearts as they give them willingly to you tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, amazing worship team, worship team, worship team. They will be back shortly, and you do not want to miss what's coming after I share a few words with you. Great to be with you. How are we doing tonight? Thunderstorms, lightning could not keep you away, could it? Yes, amen, amen. Great to be with those of you watching online. I'm excited tonight to share with you briefly one of the first lessons that I learned back in 2015 when I had the privilege to travel to Israel and to study in Israel. And tonight we're gonna be in the Old Testament, a book uh, called Joshua. It's the sixth book of the Old Testament. So if you have your Bible, you have your phone, maybe you wanna turn with me there. We're gonna be in Joshua chapter three. Let me set up the context here of what's happening in the biblical story. Moses has just died. Moses had died at 120 years of age. And upon his death, God is going to raise up now the next leader to lead his people, the Israelites. And this leader's name would be Joshua. Israel had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. A generation had entered and died in the wilderness. And now there's this new generation anxiously awaiting to enter into this promised land. And Joshua would be the leader that would take them into this promised land. However, before they could enter into this promised land, there was a barrier. There was an obstacle in their way known as the Jordan River. They would have to cross this Jordan opposite of Jericho to enter into the promised land. Now normally, this would not seem like too great of a feat, too great of an obstacle. For the Jordan River is surprisingly narrow. It's only about 50 to 75 feet wide in most areas and about eight to 10 feet deep. It actually looks pretty tame on a normal day. When I was in Israel, I took a picture of the Jordan River and this is what it looks like. It looks like something we would ride on a ferry boat through Disney World. It's pretty tame, right? Like, this is no big deal. What is, what's up with this obstacle that's keeping them from entering into the promised land? But when we read the scriptures, it tells us that it is flood season. The Jordan River flows southward. It begins at a place called Mount Hermon, which is 9,000 feet above sea level. And it flows southward to the Sea of Galilee, and then into the Dead Sea, which is about 1,400 feet below sea level. Its total distance of southward flow is about 65 miles. So during flood season, what you have is a huge amount of flowing water moving southward through a very condensed area, like a funnel, creating a powerful surge of rushing water. In fact, in 1854, an expert swimmer was unable to make it across the Jordan, which was only 100 feet, due to the dangerous rip currents of this rushing, rushing water. So to help us get an idea of what Israel was looking at that day, I went on YouTube, God bless YouTube, and found a video of the Jordan during flood season. So take a look at this, so this will give you an idea of what they were staring at that day. Okay, we get the idea. Very perilous conditions. Now just think about it, they're trying to take a nation and all their stuff and all their junk and all their luggage and all the kids and all that across this river that's flooding and could drag them. And we're gonna find in a minute there are things on the riverbed that, are, that, would, that would catch their feet and pull them under. 
So what's happening in the story is God goes to Joshua and says, Joshua, it's time for my people to enter into the promised land that I promised to their ancestors. So this is what I want you to do, Joshua. I want you to get the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is where God's law was, was kept and where God's presence came and dwelt among his people at times. And I want you to get the priests and I want you to take 12 men representing the 12 tribes of Israel and I want the Ark of the Covenant to go before, this is critical, to go before the nation. And what's gonna happen, Joshua, is when the Ark of the Covenant and the priests dip their toes in the Jordan, I'm gonna cut off the water. Right. <laughs> right. Okay, God. But this isn't the first time God did something miraculous with the waters, is it? So Joshua obeyed, and the priest took the Ark of the Covenant and went before this nation, and the priest put their feet in the water, and this is where we pick up the story, Joshua 3. I'm gonna read it straight through. Just hang with me, read along with me. It's significant just to understand all the events that are happening. They're gonna break it down, and then I'll be done. Joshua 3, verse 15. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carry the ark reach the Jordan and their feet touch the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. Adam is approximately 20 miles north of Jericho where they're at. So 20 miles upstream, the water is shut off. While the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground. Just picture this. While all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Verse four, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan. So we recognize that there was, there was a rough terrain underneath the river, for underneath the water, from right where the priests are standing. And carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from, from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, so 12 stones, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean, tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. What are these stones? They're known as standing stones. In Hebrew, they are the word masava. Say that, masava. Masava. Come on, I haven't had an audience for six months. Masava. Which means in Hebrew, to set up. And the purpose of these standing stones, as we read here, is to serve as a type of memorial. A reminder of something extraordinary that God had done for his people a reminder of his power, a reminder of his covenantal faithfulness, his goodness, a reminder of his awesomeness. And the story of the standing stones were something that were to be passed down through oral tradition from generation to generation, from generation to generation. When I was in Israel, we came upon an area that uh, represented uh, standing stones. And I want to show you a picture here of a standing stone. Now, I have to believe these are much bigger than the ones the guys got out of the river. All right, well, these are, some, these are some strong dudes. Now, I don't know what these represented. I don't know the story behind these stones. But coming upon them, we can, we can take from it that something significant either happened in this place or something significant happened in a person's life that they want to memorialize. And I can just imagine them taking back maybe their children, their grandchildren, saying, hey, let me tell you what these stones represent. Let me tell you what God did in my life. See, we are very familiar with standing stones today. We know them as memorials. How many of you have ever been to Washington, D.C.? Tons and tons and tons of memorials. 
memorial after memorial. Here's a picture of one of the memorials, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And when you go to the standing stone, you see names of men and women who paid the ultimate price. And I can just imagine that the, the, the relatives of these men and women bring their families and say, let me, let me tell you the stories that I've heard about my great-grandfather. Let me tell the stories that I heard, this, the stories of heroism and, the, and what they did. We're very familiar with standing stones, and they're very significant to God. I brought a few standing stones today that aren't rocks, but as I wanna share with you, we have many standing stones in our lives that we may not recognize as standing stones. The first I would share with you is this old cigar box. And inside this old cigar box are sermons transcribed from my great grandfather, who was a preacher. And I was gifted these sermons. This one's from March 6th, 1955, titled Idol Worship or Strange Gods. Still rings true today. Halting Between Life and Death, December 19th, 1954. And as I read these messages, and I did not know my great-grandfather, I read his words. I read of his testimony. I read of what God meant to him. I read of what the scriptures meant to him. I read about what he was passionate about, what he saw God do, and what he wanted everyone to know about his God. It's a standing stone. It's a memorial. It's passed down to a generation. Next, I've got Bibles here. And these Bibles are from my grandfather, who was a pastor. And I've got a picture of my grandfather, and you may recognize the man that he is standing next to. He's not the tall one. <laughs> it's Billy Graham. And that's my grandfather, Fred Hubbs who was the founder of the Southern Baptist Convention in the state of Michigan. And these are his Bibles that he preached from. And I got another picture here of my beautiful grandmother on the end, and that's Billy Graham and his wife, Ruth. And as I read through the pages of his Bible, I see what my grandfather understood about God. I understood what leaped out to him I understood how he interpreted who God is to him and, and how God seeks to love his people. And I was blessed to know my grandfather. But these are standing stones. Another one I'll share with you is another Bible. And this Bible reads to John from his father. See, my dad is a preacher as well. And inside this Bible are his notes, are his words, are his messages. And the significance of standing stones and the significance of legacy is if you do the math, I stand here today as a fourth generation preacher. But these standing stones speak of the goodness of God. They communicate to me something about my lineage. See, standing stones are so important. And you know why? Because at times we all suffer from Doryism. You know what I mean? How many of you have ever seen Finding Nemo? Dory? Dory, where are you? There's Dory. What was Dory's problem? Short term memory loss. If you need me to prove it another way, how many of you have ever been on your cell phone talking to someone, wondering where in the world your cell phone is? <laughs> I can't find my cell phone, man. I can't, I can't, well, are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah, it's right, it's right here. <laughs> we are forgetful. In Hebrew, is a word, the word is zakar. Say that, zakar. Zakar, come on, zakar. Zakar. Zakar means remember. 
And all throughout scripture, we see this word, remember, remember, remember. Deuteronomy 4, 9 says, be careful and watch for yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Zakar, zakar, zakar. Because the enemy would love nothing more than for you and I to forget what God has done. So when I reflect on the story of Israel, and I reflect on my story, there are three reminders that I believe standing stones give to us that I wanna share with you and then I'm done. The first one is this, God makes a way where there seems to be no way. God makes a way where there seems to be no way. See, the river represented to Israel a barrier that they must cross over, they must overcome to get to the promises that God has for them. And at times in our lives, we arrive at the riverbank and there's a rushing flood and it represents a multitude of things in our lives. Sin, financial loss, marriage problems, addiction, lust, pride, envy. And this rushing flood seems insurmountable to cross over into all that God has for my life. And I believe God says, don't forget the stones. Don't forget that I'm a God who makes a way where there seems to be no way. I've done it before and I'll do it again. I'll share with you one final standing stone. 13 years ago, my wife and I stood on a riverbank of a rushing flood and on the other side, was a healthy marriage. It was all that God intended for marriage to be, but on this side was chaos. A marriage that was not going to make it. And as we leaned into God, and it was a long, long road, and if it wasn't for the people of Discovery Church, we would not have made it. Who didn't quit on us. Came alongside of us, they were well jumpers. Remember that, they were well jumpers. And after we got to a place of the other side where things were healthy, I had a friend say to me, hey, you should have something that kind of serves as a memorial of what God did in your marriage. And at that time, I didn't know what all this was about. So my wife went out and she bought this. And this has sat for 13 years on our dresser. It's a standing stone to remind us where God made a way where there seemed to be no way. See, church, we must remember that he is still calming storms that seem untamable, moving mountains that seem unmovable, healing disease that seem incurable, mending hearts that seem unrepairable, saving marriages that seem unsalvageable, reaching children that seem unreachable, forgiving sins that seem unforgivable, drying up rivers that seem uncrossable. God is still making a way where there seems to be no way. Number two, the stones remind us that God is faithful to his promises. God is faithful to his promises. God was faithful to his promise to Israel that he would lead them into a promised land. See, a promise made is only as good as a promise kept, right? A promise made is only as good as a promise kept. And God is the ultimate maker because God has a perfect record of being a promise keeper. Now, does God always fulfill his promises how we would want them to be fulfilled? Nay, nay. (laughs) Does he do them in the timing in which we would want them to be done? Nay, nay. Israel waited 40 years. People lived, people died, but God was faithful to his promises. That's why he is God and we are not. The standing stones serve to remind us that God is faithful to his promises. His will will be accomplished regardless of what we may think. Which leads me to my final reminder. God always goes before us when we follow after him. The Ark of the Covenant went before God's people. God always goes before us when we follow after him. And each one of us that claim to follow Jesus, follow is the key word, 
I'm sure can stand today and testify to ways as you look back in hindsight how God went before you in a job, in a relationship, in a circumstance that you look back on and you wonder where God was and you see then how God went before you, unbeknownst to you at the time. I love what Mike Thompson taught on the past two weeks, Psalms 23, where it says, the Lord is my shepherd. We are to follow Jesus as sheep. When I went to Israel, our instructor, Ray Vanderlaan, uh, really wanted us to understand the concept of this rabbi-disciple relationship. So what would happen every day is he would pull up to where we were to study that day, we would be on the bus, and he would just say, come, let's go. And we'd all kind of, where are we going? I don't know, I don't know. He said, bring 10 bottles of water. Okay, we're gonna be here a while. Okay, here we go. So then we'd get off. And what we learned very soon, or very early on, was that we were to follow right behind him. So he would start to walk, and he would say, follow me. And we would follow right behind him. And we were to step literally every place he stepped. So as he went down the steps, we went down the steps. As he went up the steps, we went up the steps. As he stepped on this rock, we stepped on that rock. As he stepped on this rock, we stepped on the rock. Literally, when he jumped in the water, we jumped in the water. Follow me. We are to be like sheep. Well, early on, we had some teenagers with us from another uh, part of the uh, country that were there, and they had a lot of energy. They had a lot of energy, you can imagine that. They had a lot of energy. And they were fit, and they were thin, and they were athletic. Well, we just weren't moving fast enough at the very beginning. So what they did is they began to flank us and kind of run ahead of Ray. Well, we got to a point, Ray stopped, and he said, let's go back. We're like, go back? It took us an hour to get, what are we going back for? All right, we're going back. All right, so then we go back, and we get all the way back to where we start, and he says this, follow the rabbi, because I know what you don't know. I know where to step where you don't know where to step. I know what's over this hill that you don't know is over. Matthew 25, Jesus talks about separating the sheep from the goats. You see, the sheep will follow a shepherd right off of a cliff, but goats are always going their own way. Don't be a goat. The Lord always goes before those who follow after him. So what today can serve as standing stones in your life? What can be a reminder to you that God has made a way where there seemed to be no way, that he was faithful and is faithful to his promises, and that he does go before those who earnestly seek him. Maybe it's a journal, and maybe it's sharing that journal with someone else and say, let me just share with you what God has done in my story. Maybe it's your Bible, and maybe you need to gift someone your Bible, and there's writing in the margins and all that, and you say, you know what, I want you to, to understand who God is to me. This is a standing stone in my life, and I, I want you to have it. Maybe it's, maybe it's a painting that's significant. Maybe it's a destination, maybe it's a place that you have been, you've traveled to, and, and God did something significant, or it reminds you of something God did significant in your life, and it's a place you need to take someone else to and say, let me just share with you what God has done in my life. Maybe it's a piece of jewelry. My wife, every time she buys a piece of jewelry, tells me it's a standing stone. She's smart. Maybe it's a piece of jewelry. Maybe it's something that was passed down to you that you need, you need to pass on and you need to share that story and what that means. Maybe it's a photo. You've got standing stones. Who do you need to share those stories with in this generation? And who needs to hear those stories that are coming up in the next generation? Granddaughters, grandsons, spiritual daughters, spiritual sons. You need to bring them over, stay six feet apart, you need to share with them the standing stones in your life. I want you to take a second. I want you to think about your story. 
I'm gonna ask you a few questions and I'm done. It's easy to forget. This is a car. This is a car. How has the Lord made a way in your life where there seemed to be no way? What has he done to allow you to cross over to his promises? How has God been faithful to his promises in your story? And how has the Lord gone before you? Sakar. Maybe you're here tonight and you're standing on a shore bank and there's a rushing flood and you don't know how you're gonna get to the other side. Can I just encourage you? Remember the stones. Remember what they represent. He's a way maker. He's a promise keeper and he will go before you if you follow hard after him. Let's pray. Lord God, you never intended us to do life apart from you. And sometimes we can be goats running out ahead of you and thinking that we know better the way the direction or you're taking too long only to come to the end of ourselves time and time again and recognize we are nothing without you. God, we thank you that you are the ultimate promise maker because you are perfect in your promise keeping. We thank you that you make a way where there seems to be no way. God, we thank you that you go before us time and time again. And God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here tonight listening to the sound of my voice that may be on a shore right now in front of a rushing flood. God, tonight, may they be encouraged. Tonight, God, may you come and, and reveal something to them, God. May there be breakthrough tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, our worship team now is going to remind us of the awesomeness of God with a little help from their friends. My God is awesome. He can move the mountains. Keep me in the valley. He hides me from the rain. Yeah. My God is awesome. He heals me. Yes, he does. Forever he will reign. Let's sing it out. My God is awesome. My God is awesome. And he can move. He, can uh, move he keeps me in the valley. In the valley. Hides me from the rain. Let's say that again. My God is awesome. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broke. Yes, he does.
salvation. And it's by his stripes. Come on, we declare it. My God is awesome. Today I am. And that's the reason we're living today. So somebody else. Thank you, Pastor John, for that word tonight, man. I um, it's outstanding. There's a lot of a lot to take away there in just a few minutes, but one of the one of the things that really hit me was just that reminder that God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And we're going to sing a song right now before we leave that I just love that reminds us of that truth. It says that he's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. Light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. But before we sing that, I want to pray for you. Whether you're in the room night right now or you're at home, I want to pray specifically for those of you who would say, you know, I like that song, I like those lyrics, but tonight it's more than a song, it's more than lyrics, it's the cry of my heart. So I want to pray for you. Specifically, I want to ask you to do this. If you're here or if you're watching online, by faith, I want to ask you, if you're saying, God, you know that I need you to make a way where there seems to be no way. Maybe it's in your own life. Maybe it's in the life of someone who's dear to you. But by your hand lifted now, you'd say, God, by faith, 
I'm asking you to make way. Maybe you're, uh, you would say, God, you know it's in the area of my finances. Maybe you've been hit hard recently. Maybe it's a job loss. Maybe it's unexpected expenses that have come your way. And by uplifted hand, by faith, you're saying, God, I'm praying that you'd make a way in the area of my finances. Maybe you're here and there's a health issue. And you would just say, God, I'm raising my hand. Maybe you're watching online, sitting in your living room, wherever it is that you're sitting tonight. And right now you're raising your hand by faith and you're saying, God, I'm asking for healing. Maybe it's in the area of a relationship. Maybe like John shared, it's in, the, it's in your marriage. And you would say, God, I need you to make a way in our marriage. Maybe it's in a, a relationship that's broken with someone in your family. Whatever it might be, by uplifted hand right now, you're acknowledging, God, you know what it is. Maybe there's a place you need the Redeemer, or you need the Deliverer, but you need your God, our God, to, wake, to make a way for you. So, Father, we come before you now in faith, knowing that you are our God. We believe and we declare by faith that you are our way maker. Every promise that you have made will be fulfilled. God, we call upon your promises in our lives. God, you see every hand that's lifted in this room or I'm watching online and you know that, that what it represents. And by, by faith, someone right now is raising their hand and saying, God, I need you to make a way. You are our awesome God. We know that there is nothing too difficult for you. God, we ask that you would do it. We've seen you do it in the past. We have those standing stones to remind us, and we pray, dear God, would you do it again? So God, I pray for my brothers and my sisters right now who come before you in faith, and they're saying, God, I'm believing. I'm asking, I'm believing, and I'm trusting. I'm trusting that you are sovereign, that you are good. I love you and I trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I pray that you receive that and I pray that you receive the words to this song right now.
Even when I don't see it, you work. Hey. Hey. Even when I don't feel it, you work. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never hey. stop working. So him for just a minute tonight. together here I am Said, here I am to worship, here I am. Said, here I am to Stay here just for a minute. Yeah. 
And Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness true. Jesus, Jesus, yeah. you silence. Sing Jesus, Jesus, yeah. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Go on, let's sing this over our city tonight. We call you Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence this. the darkness. Go on, Chloe, let's sing it out. Your name. Amen. Amen. God is a God who makes a way where there seems to be no way. He is a God who is faithful to his promises. And he is a God who goes before those who follow hard after him. Zakar. Amen. Amen. It's been so great being with you tonight. Please come back next week and tell your friends about it, okay? It's so great worshiping with you. Um, we need this, amen? We need this. So uh, as we leave here tonight, um, just please remember, if you can put your masks on just till we're outside, just to continue to uh, respect and, and provide a safe environment. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. Those of you watching online, good night to you. Bye-bye. <laughs>